All right, this week we begin our third major section of the course. Uh, this section uh, is devoted to a question that is um, probably one of the most pressing, uh, personal, uh, perplexing, um, most kind of uh, important in terms of just our basic human nature. Uh, it is the question of whether we are free or determined. It's the question about whether we control our life and our choices and our decisions, or whether those decisions and choices uh, are predetermined, they're chosen for us. And so, um, you know, we're going to look at a number of different theories of freedom. We're going to look at a number of different theories of determinism. You know, so freedom is the idea that we do control our lives. And if we do, what does that mean? In what way do we control our lives? And determinism, it kind of is a very, very broad term, would mean that we don't control our lives. And we're going to look at um, systems of determinism. We're going to also look at systems of fatalism, uh, both of which are essentially saying uh, you don't have freedom. You don't control your future actions and decisions. And so we're going to look at questions like those huge questions, but also questions such as if our behavior is influenced, what influences that behavior? Is it uh, our environment, uh, the attitudes that surround us, the economic uh, status of our community? Um, that kind of that kind of question, our physical environment, uh, our personal history. What is it exactly that influences us, and does it do more than influences us? Does it actually uh, determine our actions? Um, can certain influence the same way? Can certain things influence us but not determine us? You know, in other words, point us in a, a certain direction, push us uh, towards a certain outcome, but not force us to uh, that outcome, to make that choice, uh, to become uh, that kind of person. So, for example, if you live in a very affluent, very wealthy uh, neighborhood that is all about um, the stock market, that may influence you to go in that kind of work, but are you determined? Are you fated to that? Uh, genetics is another kind of big question here. Do our genes determine uh, what our future is going to be? Um, could it be the case that some people are free and others are not? Uh, in what way would that be possible? Would your education, for example, make you more free than someone who is uneducated? By being aware of choices, by being aware of influences on us, by being self-aware, does that make us more free than others? And then finally we can ask you know, whether or not freedom is an illusion. Okay, so what we're going to look at uh, today and what the chapter uh, 8 begins with for Rachel's is a very famous case. Um, Rachel's describes it as one of the most famous uh, legal cases of all time, and he compares it to the O.J. Simpson trial, um, which is probably a little young for you guys, but still a huge, huge uh, focus of public attention. People were riveted. People wanted to know. Uh, what was going to happen. And so the case was centered around these two kids. Um, you've got Richard Leopold uh, and Nathan Loeb. Hopefully I got their first names right. But it's Leopold and Loeb. And uh, so these are two kids uh, that are very bright. You know, they're kind of going to Ivy League schools. Uh, they're coming from wealthy backgrounds, very successful backgrounds. Uh, they both kind of achieved great things in their kind of early early lives. And what they did is they decided to kill someone just to prove that they could do it. There was no motive. There was no kind of like hatred. It wasn't about vengeance. Uh, it wasn't that they felt forced to do this. They wanted to prove that they could kill someone. They got caught. They got tried. They admitted their guilt. And uh, it seemed like they were going to be headed for the for death, for the death penalty. And in walks Clarence Darrow. And uh, Rachel does a great job describing Darrow. He is a very kind of famous lawyer uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, he defended some of the biggest and most controversial cases uh, in America at that time. And so here he comes, and he's going to defend the boys. He's not going to say that they're innocent, but he is going to say that they don't deserve the death penalty. And how does he do this? Well, he essentially says, look, there is no crime and there are no criminals. And what does he mean by that? Well, essentially, what he means is that crime connotes that we are responsible for something that we could have done otherwise. And vice versa, someone who is not a criminal, the idea here is that they have chosen 
not to enter it on the criminal path. So what Daro means and what he says is, look, and he goes to this uh, prison, and Rachel describes this, and he essentially says to the prisoners, there's no moral difference between me, the lawyer talking to you, uh, or anybody else in free society, and you. There, you're not a worse person. You are not bad, and other people are good, in a moral sense. You know, socially, that is the label given to you. Uh, but it's not true that you are responsible for your actions. And at the same token, the free people are not responsible for their actions. It's not like the free person is a better person, deserves more praise, uh, should be rewarded, has a better character or something like that. No. What Daro is saying is that in both cases, you are completely determined. You could not have done otherwise. The criminals could not have avoided committing these criminal acts, and the free people outside, the successful people in society, could not have done otherwise either. They aren't in control. And he says, look, you know, I don't know what causes people to do what they do. I mean, he points to genetics and he points to environment. But he says, I can't pinpoint exactly why you, for example, uh, are sitting in a class at Newman and why I am teaching you. He can't pinpoint, for example, why Donald Trump decided to run for president or why Barack Obama decided before him. He can't tell you exactly why that's the case, but he is saying there is a reason, there is a causal explanation for why every single one of us has made the decision that we did, and we didn't make it on our own free will. It was made for us. We couldn't have done otherwise, and there's all these factors. There's genetics, there's environment, and they combine in ways that are, are kind of infinitesimally complex, but there's still an explanation. There's still a causal chain that produced this kind of behavior, that produced the kind of thoughts we're having. Um, and so what this means is that our decisions, our thoughts, our actions are products of forces beyond our control. We are not in control of our lives. There's these other forces that are. We may believe that we're in control of our lives, but we're not. And so when Darrow is arguing for these kids, and he's saying, look, they don't deserve the death penalty because uh, they didn't choose to murder this person. You know, they were forced in a certain sense by these influences uh, that are beyond their control to commit this action. And so he's saying, look, there's not, they're not insane. He's not going to use the insanity defense because what the insanity defense would imply is that you know, they're insane, they couldn't have chosen otherwise, they didn't have control of themselves, but those people that are not insane, they actually do have control of themselves. And so what he's saying is, look, the idea of insane people being out of control, insane people having control, that's again an illusion. Sane people are no more in control of their lives than are the uh, insane people. You can ask yourself, well, is this comforting or disturbing? Does this make you feel better? Uh, or worse. Okay, so again, you know, if we're not in control, if our free decision is not in control, what is it that determines us? And for Darrow, again, he points to genes. And you can think about this. You know, babies, it does seem like they have a personality. And if you've got brothers and sisters, um, and certainly if you're a mother or father, you know that your kids, you know, are coming from the same parents. But these kids do have certain predispositions. And it does seem like, you know, there's nothing you can do to change it. It seems like it's a product of their nature in some way. Uh, you know, certain people have predispositions to diseases. Certain people have predispositions to certain talents. And again, these aren't in their control. You know, it's not like they should be praised for it. Think about somebody uh, like a great athlete, for example. You know, obviously they've worked hard and everything like that. But those that are elites, they've got skills. They've got muscle structures that uh, they've been blessed with in a certain sense. They didn't choose to be able to kind of jump as high as they can or to run as hard as they can or to be as quick as they are. Uh, no amount of work is going to produce for me, uh, as an example, the ability to dunk. I could spend you know, 10 hours a day in a gym and I'll never be able to dunk. I don't have that kind of physical ability. And then another kind of... Um, uh, source of influence that Darrow points to is this idea of the environment. Uh, and this is, again, directly linked to where we came from. You know, people tend to follow the patterns set down by the society and the people 
uh, and the influences around them. Okay, um, to go to kind of return to some of the some of the key points of the Leopold and Loeb case, uh, he points to them and he says, "Look, they did not have acceptable emotional reactions. We would call them sociopaths today. They didn't feel remorse for their killings. They didn't show grief. They didn't regret it." And, you know, he's saying, look, you could look at that and say, oh, that shows, that proves that they're terrible people. That proves that they've chosen to not value human life at all. But essentially he's saying, look, um, these acceptable versus unacceptable emotions, we can't control them. They can't help that they don't feel guilt or sadness at killing another human being. Just like other people who do feel guilt and sadness at harming another, they can't help it. Um, and why is that? Well, that could be certain chemical reactions in our brain. I mean, they have done studies on sociopaths which show that, that certain parts of their brain just don't work, don't function in the way that a normal brain does. Is that their fault that their brain doesn't function properly? Certainly, Clarence Darrow would say no. And uh, many neuroscientists today would say no. That's not their choice. It's just the kind of the chemical structure uh, of their brain, and that could itself be a product of genetics. And it could also be the case that uh, acceptable versus unacceptable emotions are influenced and produced by our society, which tells us that you should feel a certain way, that you should at least exhibit certain kinds of emotions, at least appear to exhibit them. Um, and, you know, he says, look, you could, yeah, this is a big philosophical problem, you could look at them and say, that they were not loved as kids, that they didn't have close relationships with their parents. You could say that you know they had these genetic structures and they, these kind of electrical chemical imbalances in their brain. And this could provide a motive for why they do what they do. But it is, again, the motive isn't like something that they chose to take advantage of or chose to act on versus not. The motive was a product of these forces beyond their control, and whether they act on that motive or not, any of us, whether we act on the motive or not, is a product of these forces. And for Clarence Darrow, so look, nature is indifferent to human well-being. You know, nature is not designed necessarily to make everybody feel good or to protect everyone. Nature is simply designed to produce beings that generally operate for their survival. And... Um, things happen. You know, some people, or maybe most people, are naturally designed to have a certain level of compassion, or at least are uh, nurtured to have a certain level of compassion, but there's some that are not. And nature isn't feeling bad for that, uh, isn't designed to make everyone feel good or protect everyone. Uh, it simply is what it is. It produces actions. One final point about the Leopold and Loeb story. It is interesting that Leopold uh, and Rachel talks about his transformation, how he was eventually released from prison and he spent the rest of his life, quote, trying to become human again, trying to uh, be concerned about others, trying to care for others. And you can ask, well, what is that transformation? Does that prove that he has free will? Does that prove that he kind of gave up uh, his evil past where he killed someone just to prove that he could do it? Or is, again, that kind of transformation a product of forces that are beyond his control? Is it a product of socialization that he got in the prison? Uh, is it a product of this murder, you know, transforming certain uh, chemicals in his brain? Perhaps. Okay, uh, going on, you know, with this question. So there you got a case study. You've got the Leopold and Loeb. Clarence Darrow saying, look, these kids are not in control of their actions. This is a form of determinism. And essentially, determinism is saying freedom is an illusion. We feel like we're free. We feel like we're in control of our actions. But in fact, we are not. Now, one kind of form of determinism is called fatalism. And when we look at fatalism, uh, you might say it's a metaphysical denial of freedom. It's saying, again, freedom does not exist. It's an illusion. Behind that is the inevitability of certain actions. And one form of fatalism we could call logical fatalism. It's related to Aristotle. And he makes this 
interesting, intriguing thought experiment where he says, logically, every proposition is either true or false. Either you are watching this video right now or you are not. That is either true or false. Either you are enrolled at Newman right now or you're not. That is either true or false. Um, okay, so he says, well, then we can apply that to the future. Tomorrow, you will either work on your philosophy uh, weekly to-do list or you will not. Tomorrow, you will either read uh, your philosophy assignment or you will not. If it is true that tomorrow you will read your philosophy assignment, if that statement is true, then you're going to read it. So the, this kind of thought experiment goes. You can't do anything about it. Same thing. If it is true that you will not read your philosophy assignment tomorrow, then you won't. There's nothing you can do about it because either that statement is true or false. If it's false, you will read. If it's true, you won't. Now, uh, it's interesting here. It, it, it's kind of intriguing. It's thought-provoking. But it does seem to be a little empty. It doesn't seem to be that persuasive. And I think one reason for that is that we don't know the future content of our actions. <clears throat> it may be true that tomorrow you will do your philosophy work or you'll read philosophy, and that statement is either true or false. But we don't know in advance uh, whether the content is true or false. This same limitation does not apply to something called theological fatalism. And theological fatalism is interesting because whereas we don't know the future in traditional uh, theology, God does. God knows whether tomorrow you will do your philosophy work or not. Now, if God knows tomorrow you will do your philosophy work, it would seem like there's nothing you can do to change that. If God knows it is true that tomorrow you'll read, you know, pages whatever in the Rachel's book, then it would seem like you're going to do it. You can't change that action. You can't change that outcome. And in that case, you would seem to be unfree. Right? You can't do anything different. Now, the traditional theological solution is to say, God knows, uh, being omniscient, what you will do in the future, but that doesn't take away your freedom. God simply knows what free choice you will make in the future. I don't know if that's acceptable to you or not, but that is a traditional solution. Now, when we, when we, <clears throat> when we look at traditional determinism, usually it's a materialistic determinism. And essentially, what materialistic determinism would say is that everything happens because of a prior cause, and those causes are physical. And so everything can be understood in terms of cause and effect. The world is just matter. Matter obeys the laws of physics completely. These laws follow a pattern of cause and effect. So once a certain cause occurs, a certain effect follows. And the example that uh, Rachel's gives in the book is, if the light goes out, if the light were suddenly to go out in this room and it would become dark on the video, <clears throat> we would look for an explanation. Either the power coming into the house was cut off, either somebody switched off uh, the light switch, <clears throat> either there was some kind of electrical short in this room. We would look for some reason that this event occurred. Because there must be some cause, there must be some explanation. And the determinists essentially say, well, that's true of every physical entity. And we are physical beings. And so we, our existence follows the same laws of physics as any other physical thing. And so if we knew, if we were supremely knowledgeable, if we knew about all the, the almost infinitely complex um, reactions, cause and effects that occur you know, from the beginning of time, we'd be able to produce... Uh, and understanding what's going to happen in the future, a million years from now, simply because all of life, every event that occurs, is a product of these kind of cause and effect uh, reactions. And it's just a question of whether we could have knowledge of it. If we had sufficient knowledge, we could predict what will happen in the future, uh, theoretically, down to every single thought that an individual would occur, would have. Is you know, uh, Rachel's looks at the Laplace theorem on this. So we, have, uh, we assume we're free, according to this theory, but that's only because we don't recognize the causes that make us do something. Now again, 
this idea goes that we are physical beings, all of the physical universe is controlled, and so we are in fact uh, controlled. What, are, what is the immediate cause of our behavior and our actions? <clears throat> well, those are chemical states in the brain. Uh, but if we go further back, we'd say those chemical states in the brain are caused by something else. And that something else is, uh, again, a series of cause and effects that we don't have complete knowledge of. But if we did, we would be able to understand exactly why we're doing what we're doing, why we're thinking what we're thinking, and what will occur in the future. You can ask yourself, well, is there any kind of evidence for this? Or is this just kind of a wild um, kind of sci-fi theory? And the evidence is kind of interesting. There is some interesting uh, potential reasons to believe this. And certainly neuroscientists, and Rachel's talks about this, have done very interesting experiments where they, for example, physically stimulate parts of the brain and observable and repeatable motions occur. So a neuroscientist could stimulate a certain part of your brain and your hand might move. Uh, or you might get a certain sensation. You might smell something. You might see something. You might taste something by electrically stimulating a certain part of the brain. Uh, in a certain uh, example, they talked about a woman uh, hearing a Guns N' Roses song and by stimulating that part of the brain. Now, What's really kind of fascinating about this, and what you could certainly use as evidence against freedom, is that when these parts of the brain are being stimulated, and they've done this on animals too, certain actions occur, certain thoughts occur, certain sensations are felt. Now, we assume that, at least in terms of our actions, these are freely chosen. But in animal experiments and in human experiments, uh, when this occurs, when they stimulate a, a certain part of the brain that produces an action, we're not startled, we're not surprised. It's almost like we thought we were doing it. We thought we were choosing it. And in human beings, we're not only not startled, we produce reasons for why we're doing it. We don't say, well, it was an electrical occurrence in my brain and that's why I kind of got up and went to, to walk to the other side of the room. We say things like, ah, I felt like going for a walk or I thought I needed a drink of water, or I saw something over there, or I just felt like getting up. In these experiments, people give reasons for actions that are a product of electrical stimulation of the brain. And we know that it's a product of the stimulation of the brain because neuroscientists stimulate this part of the brain, and the same action occurs again and again and again. But people always give reasons. And this is utterly fascinating because what it might mean is that we're almost like participants in the illusion of our freedom. It's almost like we're playing a part in the illusion. We're saying, yeah, I did choose this when in fact we didn't. And we know we didn't because when that stimulation occurs, this particular action follows. All right, so those are the kind of arguments against freedom, um, deterministic arguments that are essentially saying, look, you're not in control of your life, you're not in control of your decisions, you're not in control of your actions. And now uh, we'll go on to look at a libertarian argument, but really think deeply about whether you agree with this position that freedom is an illusion.